Retinal Rounds, episode number 177, Silicon Oil and Subretinal PFCL Removal. Today we're honored to be joined by co-moderator Dr. Esan Rahimi, a valued Retinal Rounds contributor and adjunct clinical professor of ophthalmology at Stanford University. We'll comment on a case involving a patient who previously underwent vitrectomy with silicon oil tamponade for retinal detachment repair. Postoperatively, a submacular PFCL bubble was detected, and the patient is now scheduled for surgery to remove both the oil and the submacular PFCL. We'll discuss key surgical decision points, anticipated complications, and share strategies and pearls for these challenging scenarios. Asan, when you're, you've if you ever had to deal with subretinal PFO, and what's your preferred uh, preferred approach? Oh, that's a great question. I think, fortunately, only a handful of times in my career, I think we're pretty particular about removing all the PFO at the end of an RD case. And probably before we get into this case, it's a good opportunity to talk about that. Um, I'm usually having the fellows do a good rinse after the PFO is out of the eye. I actually like to also um, throw in the vent or the chimney and uh, pump up the pressure to 60 and let that air circulate around for a while. And uh, that PFO is volatile. It should evaporate in that 60 second period. And while this is happening, I'm already just externally suturing at least one of the sclerotides down, assuming this is a gas filled eye. You only need two of those ports to work for you. So during that period, you're suturing, you're venting, and any retained PFO should be gone. So, I, and um, yeah, so I haven't had to address that issue much. How about yourself? Yeah, the same. Um, you know, even if there is uh, sometimes subretinal bubbles, they're not always in an area that needs to be addressed, right? So if you've got some peripheral bubbles and they're not migrating, uh, obviously you can just leave that alone. Um, I have seen pre-retinal bubbles or bubbles that are in the vitreous cavity. Those generally don't cause too much in the way of vision problems. Uh, it can be bothersome for patients, but it's really not, doesn't have the toxic effect that we get worried about with bubbles that are in the submacular space. And um, you know, to your point about preventing this from happening, I think minimizing turbulence when you have, you know, if you've got a big retinectomy, you've got PFL in the eye, you really want to try to minimize turbulence. So if you've, if you've got somebody who's depressing for you while you're shaving, um, or maybe you change the order of things so that you're doing those types of maneuvers where the eye is compressed and relaxed and um, uh, doing that before the PFL gets into the eye. Um, or if it has to be with the PFL in the eye, just being very slow coming on and off the eye to decrease the amount of turbulence and bubbles that are created. Um, uh, that's, that's, I think uh, that, that's really the only other sort of tip that I would have to try to avoid getting, uh, getting bubbles and potentially getting, getting them into the subretinal space. And uh, honestly, the other thing is, you know, we, we, I, especially early in my career, I used a lot of PFL. I was just, you know, when my training, I used a lot of PFL. I felt very comfortable with it. But, you know, more and more I've tried to do cases, RD cases, and I tried tried to avoid using PFL. If I, unless I really need it, I try not to use it um, for this very reason. And it's expensive too. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a cost, um, a cost benefit as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I think unless the PFO is absolutely necessary, you know, lately when, when applicable, I just try to drain through the break if I'm not as worried about a, you know, a fold potentially developing. That may just be it. I still like to try to avoid creating retinotomies. I think those can be quite PVRogenic, but I agree with you. I think, you know, you should be mindful PFO is expensive and try to mitigate its use. Right. So, so let's just say we do, you do have a patient that's got some submacular bubbles and, and you, you, you want to take it out. What, what, what do you do? Well, assuming it's time for, for surgery, we're going to remove the oil first. And then how are we going to address the subrenal PFO? I actually had texted you about this recently on a case and, and see how you handle this. And we have several techniques we can try. I think one of the common things I'll hear from, at least from research and talking with colleagues is helping first to um, peel in the ILM that may be over that region. And it serves as somewhat of a, a barrier. And then what you do after that, whether you, you take a soft tip, go straight to that side and, and kind of like gently aspirate out and the PFO bubble comes right up as you told me it was your experience. Some patients, uh, some colleagues use um, subretinal cannulas, you know, you know, whether it's like a 41 gauge cannula or a similar size to try to extract out the PFO bubble. Um, others will actually induce an RD to kind of like get the, displace the PFO bubble because they can get, they can get kind of encased and fibrous in their place and, and they may not be as mobile too. So each of these can be kind of slightly different. Um, 
I think in the particular case we're going to see, I believe they there was peeling and, and use of the extrusion cannula over that area. Yeah, let's take a look at you it. Do. All right, so so this patient uh, is undergoing oil removal. Looks like uh, sort of a hybrid setup. So twenty three gauge uh, cannula for the oil removal, and then twenty five for the others. Is that do you like to do? I don't do too much hybrid vitrectomy. Um, do you do do you do this? No, I mean, if it's an oil removal, I'm asking for 23 gauge. Yeah. I just, I like speed and efficiency and get that oil out. Yeah. Especially if I, if I know what oil went in there before, then that, you know, 1000, sometimes I'll do a 25 gauge. If I don't know, I'm going to assume, depending where they had surgery, maybe they have 5,000 in there. I mean, good luck getting 5,000 out with 25 gauge. So I'm just assuming it's bad and put in a 23 gauge and really helps speed up the surgery. Right. Um, Doing multiple FA axes as we're seeing done here, really just get rid of any like residual oil particles and oil slick. I, I like what the surgeons did earlier too of rinsing out the bubbles that are in the anterior chamber. That's really important. Mm -hmm. I'll do that a couple of times through the case, um, and and I actually do a lot of air fluid exchanges um, because because I've seen patients who have residual bubbles even if they're really small they're really bothered by them. So I I do mm -hmm. a lot of air fluid exchanges. Uh, and look at this. So we can see the, the bubble here uh, and that supranasal macula. So it looks like they're peeling ILM. Yep. Um, and nice use of intraoperative OCT, just showing you that, that PFO bubble as well, too, for localization. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the extent of the, of the peeling, as you mentioned earlier, it could really just be, it doesn't have to extend uh, into the more peripheral parts of the macula. I mean, it could, it could just be just over this supranasal area. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was what was done in this case, just kind of like a localized <clears throat> peel over the, the PFO bubble. Mm -hmm. and the other nice thing here is it's a fairly, you know, it's a, it's, it's a well, easy to see a uh, fairly large bubble. So, you know, when, when I've, when I've done this case, I think I showed one of my cases uh, on retina rounds earlier um, what I like to do is uh, I'll have a, a soft tip cannula and it could actually be a back flush cannula or, um, or just a regular soft tip that's not attached to the machine. And, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll put the pressure up uh, a little bit, you know, maybe to, I'm usually running at like 25 millimeters of mercury, mercury. So I'll, I'll go up to maybe 30, 35, and then I'll just touch down after I've peeled the ILM, I'll just touch down on the, um, using passive extrusion. I'll just touch down right, uh, right over the, the bubble and the bubble just comes right through the retina. It's kind of incredible. So the, the surgeons here are actually using a subretinal cannula. They're kind of piercing, uh, piercing the retina, getting into the subretinal space, and maybe actively aspirating here. Going back to uh, the intraoperative OCT, you can see the bubble yeah. still there. This is also, you know, in the supranasal area. Also, an area where you, you you might be able to watch it a little bit. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Obviously, it's not in the fovea, um, but uh, you know, it's de it's definitely within that PM bundle area, and I don't. We don't know to what extent the toxic effects can extend. Uh, yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I think we're we're taught that these eventually just migrate posteriorly, keep migrating posteriorly and centrally eventually. Anyway, right? Yeah. I think hopefully. I think I'm assuming the surgeon's goal here is just make this the last surgery this patient needs. Right. Especially since I think they ended up doing what you suggested, well. right? Yeah. Especially since they're going in anyway for the oil removal, it makes sense, mm -hmm. good sense to just take that out. It's really cool that you say I got rid of it there. They did kind of your aspiration technique. So all the PFOs out. Depressing again. You routinely depress under your oil removals? All the time. Yeah. So, you know, we, and I think we've, we've talked about this on a prior episode of uh, maybe adding in some laser before oil removal, actually Steve Schwartz and, and one of his mentors over at Moorfields, they did some nice work uh, showing that uh, there's, you know, there's anywhere, there's about a 20% chance, you know, all, uh, if you look across the whole body of literature, about a 20% chance of retinal redetachment after oil removal. I still quote patients that, that rate, although, you know, in my own experience, it's never, I've never really encountered, um, uh, you know, a rate of 20% uh, retinal detachment after oil removal. But, um, 
But adding in a little bit of extra laser uh, has been uh, shown to be helpful, and so every once in a while I might uh, I might supplement uh, the existing retinopexy with some additional laser just to give a little bit of um, This is in the in the clinic before you yeah go into clinic the OR. before the oil comes out. Yeah, a couple of weeks before the oil comes out. It's a good tip. I find myself I have a low threshold to add supplemental laser around these areas as for the same exact reason, just because you hear that quoted about, and I've, I've heard the same thing, and I tell patients you know, there's about a one in five chance of redetachment when you look at all comers once oil is removed. I, I'm going to guess that rate is probably artificially influenced by some of these really like disaster cases that, you know, unfortunately just need oil left in long term. Um, but so you you operate enough and you have these eyes, you take the oil out, they look great intraoperatively, and then they're they're back in with like a total RD two weeks later for whatever reason, whether it's recurrent PBR or new break. Right. Right. Excellent. Well, Asan, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're going to have you back uh, next week. And as a regular co-host of Retina Round, so we're excited about being able to work together and, uh, you know, share our tips and, and hopefully, um, you know, get, uh, get even more people involved in, um, in, in sharing their surgical experience on this channel. So thank, Yeah, thanks for pretty joining good. us. It's I'm great looking to forward to great to work together again. You were always a mentor to me during my residency. That's why I was wearing my UCLA Stein jacket over here. So it's um, you were my fellow when I was a resident there, and you know, very very grateful for our relationship and friendship over the years. And it'll be fun to do this together. No, I, I I have to say I've learned a lot um, speaking to you and watching your watching your videos, and so I feel as as much of, if if I've ever taught you anything, I felt like I've gotten that uh, back tenfold. So thanks so much, and looking forward to more videos together. Awesome. Thanks, pretty. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.